Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the Atlanta History Center for inviting me to be here today. I'm thrilled to be here and talk about this book. It's also a real honor to be invited to be a part of the Aiken Lecture Series um, devoted to the exploration of African American life before 1941. Um, and today we're actually going to spend time together discussing the last decade of the 19th century, um, looking at the 1890s, and examining African American life and the role of images of African Americans in um, late 19th century culture and how it shaped American politics and particularly the American desire to hold on to this image of faithful slavery, of the mammy figure. I want you to think about what's happening in the 1890s as we explore this moment. Um, this is a time when the contours of modern American life are really beginning to come together. You can say that the 20th century is starting in the 1890s and that people are standing on the edge of all of these monumental changes in American life. Um, and it's a fearful edge and a thrilling edge in all kinds of ways. And we're going to be looking together at, at some of that fear and how people alleviated, alleviated those fears. You're starting to see the cohesion of a national popular culture around consumer capitalism and commodity, commodities, which is a big part of today's story. Also, increasing urbanization and mobility of Americans around the country. So one of the things that's key to understanding the role of this faithful slave story, this idea about slavery that persists in the 20th century, is also a story of the United States as a nation, um, defining itself and redefining itself. You have increased global mobili mobility as well, so massive immigration into the United States, uh, particularly from Eastern and Southern Europe. At the same time that the United States itself is taking its first forays into overseas empire building and the acquisition of Cuba and the Philippines via the Spanish-American War. So the United States on a global stage is transforming dramatically. And a key feature of modern American life is hardening legally, which is Jim Crow segregation, um, a key aspect of this story and those other elements in terms of immigration and overseas empire. The United States Supreme Court will sanction segregation with the Plessy decision in 1896, um, making racial segregation the law of the land, a law that was supported by incredible violence against black people, perpetrated both by the state directly or through an action. So in 1892, the United States witnesses the largest number of recorded lynchings in history, 230. And in the midst of all of these changes, of this violence, thrilling changes, horrifying changes. One thing keeps turning up over and over and over again in the popular culture, in the political culture, in the economy, and that is that faithful slave figure of the mammy. Um, that image of a loving and faithful enslaved person dominates politics, the economy, popular culture, and this is where my book begins, in the 1890s and in that persistence. It examines the incredible hold the idea of the faithful slave had on American culture, politics, and on American imaginations in the 20th century. Um, it seeks to understand why this particular story about slavery, the South, and about gender and race has been so durable across the 20th century and, and up to this day, that it persists in our current popular culture, um, which I'll discuss a little bit at the end. My book tries to understand what this means for national and local politics, what it says about historical memory and its effects on our contemporary lives, about regional narratives and popular representations of the South, and about the scope of resistance to these images and their place within black freedom struggles. Now, I focus on the Mammy figure not only because she is the most, um, the most prevalent and most important image of the faithful slave. There were also images of male faithful slaves in 19th and 20th century popular culture. But it's this Mammy figure that has clung so tenaciously and to, to which so many Americans have clung to. Um, she's not only then an image of a faithful slave, but she's really its ultimate representation and embodies several arguments about slavery, problematic arguments that have shaped so much of our political culture. The Mammy figure was a surrogate mother to whites and was believed to have loved the white people 
who held her in slavery. Um, this meant that that figure was totally removed from black family and black community life in, in the popular stereotype. That this woman, this mammy figure, existed only to care for white people within white domestic spaces. Um, and that she loved doing that. And that's the key to understanding both the power of mammy imagery, but also why it's so problematic and terrifying. This idea of an enslaved person who loves being enslaved and loves the people who hold her in bondage. Oftentimes, this was, was relayed in the appellation that mammy was like one of the family. Right? This, this phrase that persists across the 20th century um, to describe domestic workers, to describe other people in relationships within not only southern households, um, but across the nation. Another area that I explore in, in the book. But this phrase, like one of the, uh, excuse me, like one of the family, does a couple of, of very important things. First of all, it, it keeps the mammy figure separated from a black family. It pulls her into a white family space. Um, while at the same time, it conceals or occludes the fact that slavery devastated so many black families because it pushes those families out of the picture completely. And secondly, to suggest that the mammy figure was like one of the family slides over the fact that in slavery, so many African Americans were biologically family members of those white households. Um, it conceals the sexual domination that was a key aspect of American slavery. This character emerged in pro-slavery writing in the 1830s. So that's the first time you start to see consistent references in Southern pro-slavery literature to a mammy figure, to a black mother figure caretaking um, for whites. And it was really designed to counter abolitionist arguments that not only was um, slavery devastating African American families, but that it was also racked with sexual depravity, that this was one of the ultimate charges by abolitionists. Um, and so pro-slavery theorists sort of created this figure of the mammy as a way to say those relationships, particularly between white men and black women, aren't sexual. There's nothing coercive there, but they're maternal. And that those black women love those families and love those men, but not in a way, not in the way that abolitionists are suggesting. So you can see how this figure is proffered as the ultimate explanation that slavery is benign and that it was good and that this woman labors for white families, not because she has to, not because she's forced to, but because she loves them. And that's an amazing leap, and it's something that we have to, we have to think about. And not only do we have to think about it in terms of the story of slavery that it tells, but then why we continue to tell that story throughout the 20th century up until today. Why, why do we still cling to that idea of the mammy? What kind of effect has that had on our political lives? our social lives, and our culture. Now, I want to say from the outset that mammies, as they, as they have been described and remembered by whites, like all faithful slaves, bear absolutely no correspondence to actually existing enslaved women in history. Black women did work in white homes. Black women cooked innumerable meals, shaped southern foodways in all in important ways, cared for white children, and surely at times formed specific emotional attachments to white people in those households. But the mammy figure and the mammy story was and is a fiction. It's a story about that relationship. And over time, this fiction grew more and more persistent, um, increasing across the late 19th and 20th centuries, so that while it starts in 1830s, political and popular culture by the 20th century um, it's everywhere. And that's what my book explores, how it appears in every facet of American life, shaping this idea of race and race relations. I want to step back for a second and tell you a little bit about how I got started with this project, um, because it's also indicative of, of the, the ways that this mammy story and this faithful slave imagery has, has so... Um, saturated American culture in the 20th century. It began as a study of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, and I was looking more at um, an, an organizational history and trying to understand the role the daughters played not only in southern communities, but shaping national culture and ideas about, about the South. And so as I was doing this research, I kept coming across this story about a monument campaign 
1922 and 1923, a local chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in Washington, D.C., were almost successful, came very close to having a National Mammy Memorial erected in Washington, D.C. Now I want to pause for a second to think about that, just to, to imagine a monument, a national memorial to Mammy. Now those of you who, who have um, followed the different ups and downs of the National Mall, struggles over national memorialization and commemoration in D.C., know about you know, the, the ongoing quest for an African-American museum, a museum about slavery in Washington, D.C. In 1923, the United States Senate passed a land grant for a national memorial to Mammies. This was fast on the heels of the unveiling of the Lincoln Memorial. As so you can imagine, the kind of public conversation, the public historical conversation about slavery taking place in that moment. Um, the Senate passed the bill. It eventually was allowed to die in the House. Um, I believe and argue in the book that it died in the House because of the incredible protest and massive resistance, both of African-American organizations around the country um, and various uh, sort of white, white organizations and um, interracial activism that was really focused on trying to challenge this, this version of slavery's history that was being authorized in, in the nation's capital. But so as I kept coming across this story, it was usually offered just as an anecdote, often to say, well, the United Daughters of the Confederacy were, were very powerful, but look at how racist everyone was. And that was the end of the story. Um, but what I wanted to know was why? Why would a bunch of senators, many of whom weren't from the South, say a National Mammy Memorial is exactly what we need? in Washington, D.C. What was it about this image that made that appealing to people? And I have to say, at first, I looked at the United Daughters of the Confederacy's motivations as being pretty self-explanatory, which was something that I came to discover was, was terribly oversimple of me, that I had to really fully examine their motivations and, and their connections to these politics to understand why they would even want to put a monument like that in D.C. Um, but so as I began to, to, to research this controversy, to look at the monument, I started to realize that the story I was telling was still so narrow and didn't really get at the wider cultural prevalence of this, of this story of the Mammy figure, didn't get at what it was about the political and popular culture that made all of these people come to the table and never once ask, well, what would such a monument look like? Not one senator asked. Now, they said, we want to make sure that the Committee of Fine Arts has final say over what it, what it looks like. But they knew who Mammy was. They knew what the general contours of that monument would be. And so this, this book began as a study of, of, of understanding why they knew and what the resistance was to, to broadening the frame and, and looking at the 20th century in total. A key feature of all of this has been the role of, of the Mammy figure and faithful slave stories also in various kinds of black activism. That this story has been so dominant within the popular culture that, that activists and journalists had to deal with, with this image and oftentimes used it strategically to advance different, different political aims. And, and part of what I'm talking about specifically today in the 1890s touches on, on this aspect. And I think to to understand why we've been spared the horror of a National Mammy Memorial in D.C. is, is, is to understand um, those, those African-American um, organizing techniques and, and the kinds of the positive elements and also the kinds of constraints that, that that activism placed on black women who really have struggled against that image of the Mammy figure in ways that are so specific um, and have often run counter to some political aims of different organizations, which is another, another key facet of the book. Now, I think that understanding the 20th century story begins with something y'all are probably very familiar with, Aunt Jemima pancake mix and the Aunt Jemima trademark. Uh, the product was invented in 1889 in Missouri, um, which was the same year that the man who invented the pancake mix saw a minstrel show and saw Old Aunt Jemima performed, which was a song that was written by an African-American minstrel performer, which means the song was written by um, an African-American performer who then put on blackface to do a minstrel song 
about um, old, old Aunt Jemima. The minstrel show that Chris Rutt saw, who was the creator of Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix, was probably, it's, it's been hard to verify historically um, if it was the team Baker and Farrell or if it was one of the members. They were white men who were minstrel performers. Um, so he saw one of them in blackface, in drag, doing old Aunt Jemima and said, that's it. That's my pancake mix. And to understand um, what it was about that vision of slavery, about that vision of African-American womanhood that seemed so appropriate to sell pancake mix is then to start to get it the role this image has played in, in 20th century popular culture. So I'd like to, I'm going to read two very short sections today. Um, and I'd like to start by reading just the opening pages of the book, which describe the moment that Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix went from being a local Missouri-based product in 1889 um, to being unveiled for a national audience in 1893 at the Columbian World's Exposition or the Chicago World's Fair. So this is, this is the opening scene. When newspapers reported her death in 1923, many obituaries sounded a common refrain summed up by a headline in the Missouri Farmer, Aunt Jemima is gone. Americans had first fallen in love with the ex-slave cook and her secret recipe for pancakes at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in the summer and fall of 1893. By all accounts, her debut there had been glorious. Fairgoers were drawn to the giant barrel-shaped concession of the R.T. Davis Milling Company by the smell of buttery hotcakes, the sounds of laughter and applause rising above the general roar of thousands of people moving through the agriculture building. A singular voice called to them with a southern cadence reminiscent of the old days. It was the voice of an old black woman they would soon come to know as Aunt Jemima. As she slid steaming pancakes onto platters, the woman described her days as a slave. Winking and grinning at the audience she held enthralled, Aunt Jemima told of happy times passed on a beautiful plantation, of endless parties and parades of house guests for whom she cooked bountiful stacks of her delicious pancakes, which were famous throughout the South. Oh, how they loved those hot cakes. And now, thanks to the Davis Milling Company, people all over the country could have pancakes made from Aunt Jemima's secret recipe. All you had to do was add water to the mix, she explained. No need to measure or have eggs and milk on hand, just a little water and a hot griddle for perfect pancakes every time. They were so easy to make and so delicious. It was as if Aunt Jemima herself was in your kitchen making them for you. People in the dense crowd at the exhibition stand crushed forward to get a better glimpse of the woman who had been a slave and to sample her pancakes. Aunt Jemima kept the spirituals, work songs, and stories coming while she flipped hotcakes, poured fresh discs of batter, and filled plates for her hungry audience. They were hungry for the food, hungry for grand plantation abundance and refined southern hospitality, but most of all, they were hungry for her. The elderly woman whose death was reported in 1923 was not Aunt Jemima. No such person had actually existed. The woman who was struck by a car and killed, who for 30 years held the job of acting the role of Aunt Jemima, was Nancy Green. While Aunt Jemima was dubbed, quote, the most famous colored woman in the world, after the Columbian Exposition, Nancy Green's life was obscured by the trademark figure she portrayed, and by the faithful slave image she embodied. Green, born into slavery in Kentucky, had made her way to Chicago, where she worked as a domestic servant like so many other African-American women before and after her. Someone visiting her employer's home believed that she might satisfy R.T. Davis's search for a black woman to demonstrate his new product. Perhaps it was her skill, her convenient location in Chicago, her force of personality, or all of these attributes that suggested her suitability to portray Aunt Jemima. What is clear is that Green did not come to Chicago at the behest of a milling concern, nor had she arrived with a secret recipe for terrific pancakes, and no one had ever called her Aunt Jemima before. Vivid accounts of her debut at the fair have been told over and over, yet they all ultimately trace back to advertisements and promotional materials produced after the event, not to eyewitnesses and not to Green herself. Nancy Green's experience of working at the exposition was transformed through ads and a pseudo-slave narrative produced by the R.T. Davis Company into an event in the commercially constructed life of Aunt Jemima. 
And when the real Nancy Green was accidentally killed, her popular eulogy became, Aunt Jemima is gone. But in 1923, Aunt Jemima was not gone. Both the trademark and the popular figure of the slave Mammy outlived Nancy Green. Stories and images of the slave as a faithful and loving dependent, of which the Mammy has been the most popular representation, drenched American culture and politics throughout the 20th century and persist to this day. Another popular variation is Scarlett O'Hara's feisty but adoring and loyal Mammy in the film Gone with the Wind, as she was played by Hattie McDaniel. The fictional character, whose only name was her descriptor, Mammy, remains dear to the hearts and plantation fantasies of many. Yet Aunt Jemima, her smile beaming still from store shelves, freezer sections, and kitchen cupboards, is the most enduring image of the faithful slave. The drama of Nancy Green's life eclipsed by the Mammy figure has been played again and again in the experiences of black women in the United States. The myth of the faithful slave lingers because so many white Americans have wished to live in a world in which African Americans are not angry over past and present injustices, a world in which white people were and are not complicit, in which the injustices themselves of slavery, Jim Crow, and ongoing structural racism seem not to exist at all. The Mammy figure affirmed their wishes. The narrative of the faithful slave is deeply rooted in the American racial imagination. It is a story of our national past and political future that blurs the lines between myth and memory, guilt and justice, stereotype and individuality, commodity and humanity. And this is Nancy Green, the only two pictures that we have in the extant historical record. The first on the left, um, the date and the original source are unknown. And actually, even in the fact that we don't know where that picture comes from, I think it might be from a church bulletin. She was a founding member of the Olivet Baptist Church in Chicago, um, which was one of the most powerful churches in early 20th century um, black Chicago. And she was a part of the, the she uh, was a part of the missionary committee and provided resources for mission work. Um, that image itself, though, comes from a, a trademark from a history of the Quaker Oats Company, which now owns the Aunt Jemima trademark. And the trademark went through several owners in the early 20th century. Um, but so the institutional Quaker Oats history published that photograph in the 1960s. And then the picture on the right is a picture that was run alongside her obituary in the Chicago Defender, which is an African-American newspaper in Chicago. Um, and it was run September 8, 1923. And if you notice underneath, and I know the print's a little, a little small, but it says Mrs. Nancy Green. Now that photograph was run four days earlier in the Chicago Tribune, the largest white-owned paper in the city. When the picture was run in the Tribune underneath, it just said Aunt Jemima. Nancy Green's name didn't appear until you got inside the obituary itself, which was focused primarily on the coroner's inquest um, about the, the accident that killed her. And I think Nancy Green stands at, at, at the point of confluence for all of those, those elements that I was describing at the end of the section that I just read. Um, her life was hidden behind this trademark image of Aunt Jemima, so much so that upon her death, it's Aunt Jemima who is mourned and not this individual, this individual woman and her individual history. Um, and in, in that, her, her experience is emblematic of so many African-American women's um, work lives and daily lives confronted with this mammy image, which later in the book, I go on to describe as African-American women's mammy problem. They face this, this icon um, in all of these different aspects. Nancy Green first portrayed Aunt Jemima at the Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition. And in starting with the Chicago World's Fair in this book, um, I joined leagues of American historians who have located sort of the dawn of modern popular culture and modernity in the United States at the Chicago Fair, that this is a, a key place in cultural history to start, tart, excuse me, to, start to see those, those changes and the onset of modernity. It was an early crystallization of the cultural 
economic and imperial trends of the 20th century, that it was to celebrate Columbus's discovery of the New World, but really it was about promoting American ingenuity and power on a global stage and responding to the Paris Exposition of a few years earlier. Um, the image that you're seeing here, and, and mind you, all of, this, all of those structures were built for the fair itself. None of them were designed to be permanent. And so you're, you're seeing sort of this artifice of um, a grand civilization, of this grand city. And it was actually called the White City, and that was the center of, of the Columbian Exposition. Um, to get into the White City, you could, you could arrive from, you could arrive by water, you could come in by train, but many people went through a long um, sort of gallery, a long street that was called the Midway Plaisance, that was human sideshows, places you could go get food, um, and really an, an exhibition space for all the other aspects of the world, for the other parts of civilization that were not quite at the White City. Um, you had exhibitions of colonized peoples, there was a place called Dahomey Village, which was a representation of Africa. Um, and then going through these human exhibits, you would end up, you would come out in this, in the White City, as if you had literally walked the progression of humanity in that moment. And so you can see how these racial and gendered ideas were set up in the structure of, of the fair itself. And this was one of the biggest things to happen in the United States in the late 19th century. Over 28 million people went to Chicago to see this fair and to see those exhibits. And millions more read about them in weekly and daily dispatches in their newspapers. And so even if you couldn't actually be in that space, you knew what that space looked like and, and had read about it. And there had been significant conflict around the construction of the Chicago World's Fair um, because African-American activists wanted to find a place for representations of African-American contributions to American progress and power and civilization. And really, because the fair was designed in this way, it became a site of all of these different competing claims for access to that kind of, kind of power. And one of the great celebrated features of the fair was a woman's building that separately celebrated women's contributions. And in, along the same lines, um, African-Americans sought some kind of similar representation but were consistently denied. Uh, Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells participated in the writing of a pamphlet that was circulated around the fair called The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the Columbian Exposition, which detailed not only African American history since emancipation, but the struggle for some kind of meaningful representation. So on the one hand, you have a quest for this kind of representation at the fair, and on the other, you have Aunt Jemima presenting this particular image of slavery and of um, black women, this connection to the South and food and um, her experience there. Well, Nancy Green's experience is, is, is shoved to the side, but this image of the faithful slave is proffered as, as a part of this, this story of progress. The demonstration itself, that I described in the section that I read was held in the agriculture building. And here you're getting a view of the inside. I'm just going to step away from the mic for a second. Right over in that area, on the second gallery, is where Aunt Joanna's pancake mix was being demonstrated. At a giant, it was a giant barrel-shaped structure. Um, and she stood outside and cooked samples. People who wrote of the fair commented on all the food that was being demonstrated at the top in these upper galleries and said around lunchtime, everyone headed to the agriculture building to get free food. And actually, you had a lot of people comment on getting Aunt Jemima's pancakes. Um, although one journalist said, go get a tasty Aunt Dinah's pancake, which was um, probably the last time the name was mistaken for, for something other than, other than Aunt Jemima. This is actually a detail, and so you can still see um, this faint, but this is the barrel-shaped structure back there. And I think in front of it, um, there's sort of this ghostly image of a woman that I'm sort of convinced, and this may actually be my own sort of historian's desire, that Nancy Green's picture is there. And I tried to, I tried to show the publisher, don't you see that? And she said, I don't see it. But I think Nancy Green is haunting that picture of, of the, 
the, the, the display stand. Um, because that image and, and it shows up again and again, but to a terribly skewed, skewed end. Um, Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix was on the front edge of technology, marketing, advertising across the 20th century. And its debut at the Chicago World's Fair um, is really the, the start of that. So it's in the middle of the biggest event of the late 19th century that's sort of unveiling modernity in the United States. Um, in addition to having uh, Aunt Jemima played by an actual living person who wouldn't be called an actor, but would be called Aunt Jemima, R.T. Davis came up with one other big, big change in the, in the pancake mix before the fair. He added powdered milk, which meant all you had to do was add water to mix up Aunt Jemima pancake mix, making it one of the first ready mix products on the American market. So convenience was its selling point. Convenience that was being sold by the image of slavery, of happy slavery. One historian, Maurice Manring, has, has, has written a wonderful book just on the history of, of the, the trademark, and he calls his book Slave in a Box, that that's essentially what R.T. Davis was selling people with Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix. But Nancy Green's life became fully entangled in this image of Aunt Jemima, in part because of advertising. This is the cover of the fake slave narrative that was written about Aunt Jemima's life that was used as a promotional tool for Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix called The Life of Aunt Jemima, The Most Famous Colored Woman in the World. And it came out in 1895. Um, Perd Wright, who wrote this, was one of the first taste testers for the pancake mix. He was a librarian in St. Joseph, Missouri. And you can see on the image sort of an early version of the trademark but also the way you're getting sort of these abstracted visions of slavery so that Aunt Jemima is standing with cotton, even though this is about pancake mix. And so you're getting sort of these, these, this pastiche of images of enslavement. Now, the distortion of Nancy Green's life by this pseudo-slave narrative is doubled because on the one hand, you have Nancy Green shielded, her identity shielded behind the Aunt Jemima trademark. But you also have her actual experience of slavery shielded in this phony slave narrative that promotes that idea that Aunt Jemima loved being enslaved, loved cooking pancakes, and now was thrilled to come north after the Civil War and share her pancake recipe and, and mix. And so that the actual experience of slavery was literally erased in this mythology. This is an image from inside the life of Aunt Jemima, which shows Aunt Jemima showing up at that barrel-shaped exhibition stand at the fair. So now, Nancy Green's experience of going to the fair to work a job and pretend to be Aunt Jemima to demonstrate pancake mix becomes a part of this story, becomes a part of this, of this life of Aunt Jemima. And this would persist across the 20th century. So that... And, you get, this is an image of a placemat. I apologize for the quality of the scan. Um, this is a placemat from Aunt Jemima's Kitchen, which was a restaurant at Disneyland that opened, I think very tellingly, in the midst of the Montgomery bus boycott. So as the Montgomery bus boycott is underway, Disneyland opens the Frontierland section of the park with what was originally Aunt Jemima's Pancake House. Um, by the early 1960s, they had changed the name to Aunt Jemima's Kitchen. Um, which arguably, on the one hand, opened up the menu, made, made it possible for them to sell lunch and dinner and other things, um, but also pretty much locked that figure of Aunt Jemima into kitchen space, into domestic space. I mean, you almost get this argument that on the one hand, you pick up your evening newspaper or you turn on the television and you see African-American men and women in the streets fighting to change this kind of historical narrative but rest assured, at Disneyland, you can still go to Aunt Jemima's kitchen. Um, along this side is a series of images. They were illustrations done by N.C. Wyeth in the 1920s for a series of magazine ads. And the very bottom one, which I realize it's, it's very small, um, is actually an image of Aunt Jemima at the World's Fair. And it says underneath, this is Aunt Jemima 
at the World's Fair. So again, you're having this story just persisting across, across the 20th century. And on the other side, in the 60s, you still had women portraying Aunt Jemima going all around the country for what were called community pancake days or opening new grocery stores. And so you get pictures of that. So you get yesterday and today. And of course, the underlying fact is that Aunt Jemima persists yesterday and today. These are two ads for Aunt Jemima pancake mix in the 1890s. Um, the one on the left is a magazine ad. And the one on the right, blown up for the sake of, of having the two images similar size in the PowerPoint, is actually a newspaper ad. It was a very narrow, smaller ad run in, in a newspaper column. Notice at the top of both this phrase, eyes in town, honey, in dialect, right? So that when Mammy, when Aunt Jemima speaks, she speaks in this dialect that's been used to mark um, and distance African-American life and speech in this, in this popular culture context. It referred to Nancy Green and other African-American women who were portraying Aunt Jemima at events, at grocery stores, um, oftentimes at charity functions, uh, that Aunt Jemima was coming to town. And that Eisentown honey, so the dialect suggests that difference, but the honey suggests I love you. The honey says to the consumer, this is about emotional caretaking as much as it is about the food. Around the same time, two years later, at the next World's Fair, Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix and Aunt Jemima and Nancy Green play an important role. And I would like to share the next short version that is at this fair two years later and the experience in Atlanta, which was both different and in some ways very similar to the experience in Chicago. Located in the capital city of the New South, the Atlanta Cotton States and International Exposition of 1895 displayed the same swelled chests and spectacular schemes of the Chicago Fair two years earlier, if not its grand scale or enormous attendance figures. Designed to showcase the region's dramatic post-reconstruction economic growth and potential, the Atlanta Fair aimed to attract tourism, business interests, and capital investment, and to position the region as a gateway to international markets further south. Key to this construction of a modern new south was the impression of harmonious race relations sustained through benevolent white management. Just a year shy of the U.S. Supreme Court's Plessy decision declaring separate accommodations to be constitutional and potentially equal, the Atlanta Fair celebrated legal segregation as a panacea for local and national race and labor problems. The figure of the faithful slave appeared in various incarnations at the fair to support this argument and to suggest historical continuities between the Old and New South. Aunt Jemima pancake mix was demonstrated there, and since Nancy Green was said to have attended every fair before her death except for the one in Paris, it is likely that she was in Atlanta. Although after the exclusions of Chicago, many thrilled at the inclusion of a Negro building created and overseen by an African-American board of managers, several black organizations and newspapers encouraged a boycott of the fair on account of segregation in the city of Atlanta broadly and in the fair's planning and execution in particular. Arguably, the Negro building could be taken as an example of supposed Southern white benevolence toward blacks as much as it could a record of black achievement and progress. White fair managers could argue that the Southern white man was indeed the best friend of the Negro when they noted the absence of such a feature at the Chicago fair. Planners and the press made much of the fact that the building had been designed and built by black people, failing to note that much of the fair had been built by black labor and that predominantly black convict, work, convict workers had initially cleared the grounds for the exposition. Yet all transportation, public facilities, and audience seating were strictly segregated. And while black fairgoers could enter any building on the grounds, they could find refreshments only in the Negro building. Since it was located at the far southwestern edge of the fairgrounds at the corner of Jackson and 10th Streets, between the Midway Heights concession and the grandstand for Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, this meant a long walk from the rest of the attractions for African-American visitors. The fairgrounds layout complicated the aims of the Negro building further by putting it so close to 
and thus likening it with the human sideshows of the Midway and Buffalo Bill's acts. Among the concessions made especially for Atlanta was the old plantation, where visitors could watch and listen to faithful slaves dance, sing, and play fiddles and banjos. The old plantation was the only concession President Grover Cleveland visited on his official trip to the exposition, a fact later promoted in advertisements. Variations on the concession at subsequent fairs, both in and outside the region, claimed to be composed of actual slave cabins. At every turn, fairgoers were encouraged to see a dynamic new South still connected to old Southern traditions through plantation fantasy and white paternalism. Representations of faithful slavery even carried into the Negro building itself. Flanking the outside of the hall's main entrance were two reliefs, one of a black mammy and the other of a recently deceased Frederick Douglass, arguably the two most famous black figures of the day. At first glance, there seemed to be a certain irony in the pairing of these two figures, the fictional faithful slave and the famous runaway slave abolitionist and radical activist. At least one contemporary commentator argued that this was purposeful and appropriate. In an article devoted to Booker T. Washington's celebrated appearance at the fair, a reporter described the two medallions as opposite ends of the trajectory of black progress, quote, representing the past and present conditions of the Negro. Notably, this vision of black progress equated the past with faithful slavery, uh, with the faithful slavery of black women, while the contemporary period was defined by manly action, remarkable individual achievement and strength of character, a gendered historical framing that would animate a range of black activist rhetoric throughout the 20th century. The building's 25,000 square foot interior was divided into 14 state exhibits, separate displays featuring fine arts, literature, and patented inventions created by African Americans, and a large restaurant. Several of the state exhibits were dominated by contributions from black institutions of industrial education, such as Booker T. Washington's own Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. The Negro Building also provided a variety of special services for black visitors, necessitated by segregation at the fair and its host city. In addition to the restaurant, these included a medical facility and an information center for those seeking overnight accommodations at establishments open to black guests. In all, no site at the fair other than the Women's Building would receive more visitors than the Negro Building. If the medallions at the entrance represented the two most famous black figures of the day, the fair became best known for introducing to the nation another famous African American, Booker T. Washington. His address on opening day, eventually dubbed the Atlanta Compromise by critic W.E.B. Du Bois, solidified Washington's place as the leading black political voice of the early 20th century. At the fair, Washington crafted his vision of black progress in the New South through accommodation, gradualism, and economic independence, largely around the figure of the faithful slave. When he asked white Southerners to cast their buckets where they were, by which he meant to continue to rely on a black Southern workforce despite the influx of white or whitening immigrants, Washington appealed to a nostalgic plantation history that he claimed both races shared. And this is from Washington's speech. While doing this, you can be sure in the future, as in the past, that you and your families will be surrounded by the most patient, faithful, law-abiding, and unresentful people that the world has seen. As we have proved our loyalty to you in the past, in nursing your children, watching by the sickbed of your mothers and fathers, and often following them with tear-dimmed eyes to their graves, so in the future, in our humble way, we shall stand by you with a devotion that no foreigner can approach, ready to lay down our lives if need be in defense of yours, interlacing our industrial, commercial, civil, and religious life with yours in a way that shall make the interests of both races one. This was followed immediately by the most famous statement of Washington's speech. In all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. With his easy transition from examples of interracial intimacy to an apparent endorsement of segregation, Washington suggested a very different arc of black progression up from slavery from the one on display at the entrance to the Negro building. He offered plantation nostalgia as evidence of contemporary patience and a lack of resentment among black Southerners for past and present wrongs. Washington manipulated the ability of the faithful slave story to assuage white guilt in hopes of creating a space for some degree of cooperation, free from the suspicion and violence that guilt often engenders. 
Washington assumed the mantle of leader of the race in the year of Frederick Douglass's death through his appeals to the very same plantation fictions that Douglass had worked so hard to refute. Bringing to mind the promotional Aunt Jemima buttons of the Chicago Fair two years earlier, a proponent of Washington's vision suggested a lapel pin commemorating the speech. William J. Kanzler, a prominent black teacher from Knoxville, Tennessee, asked Washington, couldn't that expression of yours, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one is the hand in all things essential to mutual progress, be symbolized in the form of a button worn on the lapel of coat, as are worn by Grand Army men, Odd Fellows, Masons, represented as an open hand, fingers extended and diverging? This could be sold on exposition grounds at the Negro exhibit and would be bought and worn by thousands, both white and colored. It would fittingly symbolize a new epic in the Negro's history in the South, as well as immortalize the expression. Kanzler's pen would testify to one's loyalty to Washington's brand of politics, as it would also serve as an income-generating souvenir of the Atlanta Fair itself. It would indeed signify this new epoch in Southern and national history in which the color line was drawn, maintained, and adapted to through stories of faithful slavery. Notions of racial intimacy in the context of a strict hierarchy personified in the loyal ex-slave were central to Washington's articulations of a regionalist black politics of gradualism and accommodation. They were as much an animating force of his aspirations for the race as a strategy for wooing Southern whites to the cause of black progress. In that same speech, he appealed to black Southerners to cast their buckets where they were, a spatial metaphor for accepting their place within existing hierarchies and simultaneously a call to remain in the South or in their geographic place. A staunch regionalist, Washington would devote much of his political life to discouraging black migration. It is ironic that the woman who served as the very embodiment of the modern faithful slave to which Washington appealed had herself left the South for Chicago some time earlier. As Washington spoke that afternoon of the past lessons for realizing a potentially bright Southern future, it is possible that Nancy Green was elsewhere at the fair serving pancakes as Aunt Jemima. Like so many other African Americans living in or visiting Atlanta that day, both she and Washington were former slaves. For Nancy Green, the journey to Georgia would have meant a return to the region she had left. For both, the exposition meant a journey into the old south of white imagination and fantasy. Images of the Mammy and plantation legend shaped Green's and Washington's lives in profound ways. While the faithful slave narrative helped to catapult Booker T. Washington to national fame and political power, it simultaneously plunged Green into historical obscurity behind Aunt Jemima's designation as the most famous colored woman in the world. This is one depiction of the fairgrounds, um, currently Piedmont Park. This is an image of the Negro building itself. And the last image I wanted to show you is actually one of the, the plans for the fair, which show. Um, in Chicago, this same kind of, of layout, which suggested an argument about civilization and about human progress, um, took place at the juncture of the Midway Plaisance and the White City. As you walked the Midway, at the end, you came to the Woman's Building, as if you had come out of those progressions of civilization, and that white women represented one step shy of the White City itself. One of the things that was very interesting about that is once, right before you got to the woman's building, you went through what was basically a girly show. It was, a, um, it was called the, the 40 Beauties of 40 Nations, um, and it was actually just scantily clad women. And so it was juxtaposed right next to the woman's building. And so you've had all of these things that seem to sort of undercut some of these arguments. And so on the one hand, the Negro building was such a key feature of the fair, but it participated in that same kind of logic. This is the very beginning of the book. And it's a story 
of this kind of, um, of the political impact in, in a variety of ways, both in terms of white supremacy and in attempts to fight white supremacy that the faithful slave figure of the Mammy shaped um, and animated and, and promoted. Uh, but I want to end with, with a couple of images that think about the contemporary period and think about the fact that, that we still cling so tightly to this, this story. Um, the first one, actually, they're both very familiar. Um, Aunt Jemima Pancake Man. This is, we could walk down the street to the grocery store and buy this today. And you see how the Aunt Jemima trademark has transformed over time. But what I want to call your attention to is two things. First of all, that the reason why Aunt Jemima doesn't look the same today is because of black activism, is because of challenges to that trademark image and challenges to this story. Yet, this woman's face now, professional, not covered by the bandana that had covered Aunt Jemima's head, is still next to that name, Aunt Jemima. That same font that's been used for decades. Um, and that is not progress to me. What that suggests is that any African American woman can be Aunt Jemima, as described by this box. Um, there's another ad that, that I would like to, to end with that I think gets at the Mammy problem that specifically has confronted African American women who do domestic work. And you can see how this has been folded into something you all might recognize, the Pine Saw Lady. Notice the Pine Saw Lady's tagline, honey, you still mopping with dirty water? It's dialect and it's honey. It's telling that presumably white female consumer, I love you and I'm going to help you clean the floor better. Um, look, notice her clothes. These images are all around us. They still shape our politics dramatically. And it's so important for us to recognize the history behind the Pine Saw Lady and the way that they enter the mundane aspects of our lives and just become a part of that warp and woof and don't seem so strange anymore, which is perhaps the most terrifying part of this story. Um, so I'm thrilled to have been here with you all today, and I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Defended themselves with the abolitionists. Did you find yeah. that in some, of the, um, in some of the work that you did, the historical work? Yes, certainly. And this idea that, on the one hand, the, the mammy figure eases those sexual anxieties by saying, well, this relationship is just motherly, and it's surrogate, um, not sexual. And the Jezebel is a stereotype of, of voracious black female sexuality, and so that in those instances where you can't deny that there, um, there has obviously been sex across the color line, it's her fault, right? That, that, um, that, and that she actually... Um, sort of forced the issue and demanded it. And so you've got these two figures that exist to explain um, the horrors and coercions of American slavery and to put the responsibility on African-American women. And I think the key contribution of Catherine Clinton and of Deborah Gray White um, is noting that that figure, that story could be applied to the same black woman, depending on the context and the needs of the white people telling the story. Um, and so that it's not that those two characters exist and are actual historical figures, but that it's a story describing motivations and outcomes that's about um, denying those, those aspects of slavery. But, but certainly, and, and I mean, I think one of the things that I look at um, are you know, narratives of, of interracial relationships that really look to this mammy figure, that look to the presence of African-American women in white homes. Um, both within the South, they predominate in the South, but these narratives aren't confined to Southerners only, um, that really hunger for this emotional connection and for a sanctioned emotional connection. And I think that that's also um, one of the things that we really miss if we kind of buy the lie of, of the mammy figure and, and, and the fact that this, this idea that she's asexual without desire um, and without connection to anyone is, is how physical those, those relationships are described to be, how hungry people are for, you know, they talk about um, Mammy's bosom and, and, and her hugs and her physicality, that there's, there's something profoundly physical and um, 
and sensual about, about that story. going on the tour. <laughs> you only um, have a minute. Being here in Atlanta in this sort of baseball time of year and uh, seeing some of the other portrayals yeah. that you've presented today, I wonder if you see other uh, sort of similar perpetuations of racial stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, this, of course, about Atlanta yeah. Braves, but more the Cleveland Indians right now. Uh -huh. and, and what's your take on the survival of these type of images? Yeah, well, and I think that, that it's one of the things you see in, in the persistence of, of Aunt Jemima, say, and the, and the transformation in that trademark is um, the desire to hold on to it and also respond to, to um, both activism and political changes and an economic marketplace. I mean, I do think there's a big difference, although in, in some ways we've got sports teams are also marketing organizations. And so um, I think that's part of why you don't see changes in, in the Braves or the Cleveland Indians, whether it's Florida State the attempts to, to change um, change the image there. And I, I think that these stereotypes have profound consequences on our politics, which is why it's so important to, to examine um, that it's not just a brave on a baseball team, on a baseball hat, or that it, it's about promoting a story about race and about history um, that I think is terribly damaging to, to our contemporary, contemporary environments. And, and I think partially, part of that damage is in the repetition. That one of the things that I, that I kept thinking as I was, I was working on this book is that, um, that this is a story of stereotypes, but that stereotype almost doesn't explain it because the power of a stereotype lies in its removal from history, that it seems to not be connected to anything. It's just common sense. It's just a truth. And how often have you heard people say, well, you know, there's a, a germ of truth in the stereotype. That's why stereotypes work is because they're true. I disagree completely. Stereotypes work because you've heard them and seen them so many times that you think they're true. And so it becomes common sense. And I think that that's something that can seem, and I know it's, that it's, if, if you're a baseball fan, it's not mundane or, or <laughs> benign at all, but something that can seem so um, just a part of daily life that, that doesn't seem to have huge consequences has enormous consequences in much the same way. Oh, yes, fine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, I, I didn't, although I, I'm from, well, I'll say, when I, when I first got to Alabama, I, I did my PhD at NYU, and so I moved to Tuscaloosa from New York, and, and I'm doing Southern Studies, and I teach this material, and a lot of people say, what are you doing coming from New York teaching this at the University of Alabama? And so I said my first semester there, um, oh, well, but my, my whole family's from Paducah, Kentucky, and that's, you know, that's where my, my Southern chops come from, and immediately, Students in Tuscaloosa said, um, that's not the South. And so I said, oh, all right. So now it was a different kind of lesson in geography and, and, and border states. But I grew up um, in a very Southern identified family uh, with a lot of these sort of material objects that celebrate Mammy imagery, salt and pepper shakers, cookie jars, that kind of stuff, um, in Boise, Idaho. So very distance from my family in Kentucky. And I said this started as a very originally as a project on the United Daughters of the Confederacy. When I was a kid, my grandmother enrolled me in Children of the Confederacy when I was in Boise, um, which I, I understand now was very much her attempt to, to try to forge that connection between us and that historical, what she valued and, and what she believed was so important that she didn't want me to lose being in Idaho and, and wanted to, to keep that, that connection there. And so in some ways, when I first got into this project, it was about trying to understand my grandmother's desire to do that and my own very um, conflicted, uh, conflicted way of thinking about being a child in Boise, Idaho, wearing a 
the United Daughters of the Confederacy pin on my snow parka, right? And then that, that I was wanting to do this anti-racist work and trying to understand the kind of racism that shaped my own upbringing and the stories in my own family. And so I did not, um, members of my family have talked about domestic workers in the 1950s, African American women in their homes like mammy figures. And, and the book ends with a discussion actually of the Montgomery bus boycott as a moment when you had collective action by African, you know, most of the boycotters are African American women who are domestic workers who would ride the buses to segregated enclaves. And this was a moment of saying, I'm not your mammy, I don't love you, and we're gonna change this. And that that really shattered people's perceptions of their individual relationships with those women. Um, and so it's certainly, there is a personal architecture to all of this. Um, but also I, I, I hope that, that uh, I hope that the book can have those, those anti-racist consequences. I value that you said you sense passion, because that's why I wrote it. I was wondering if you could say anything about the, in your research, mm -hmm. did, what did you discover about the harsh realities, uh, not the stereotype, but mm -hmm. the harsh realities of what actually was a, uh, a colored person working in a white home before the turn of the century. Yeah, well, and you start to see in terms of, of domestic work, not slavery, in terms of, of domestic work. But yeah. Well, in slavery, I think, and one of the key things to think about is, is, is there are several in the history of slavery, these distinctions between um, enslaved people who were forced to work in white homes and then those who worked in the fields. And so that those experiences were very different. And, and a, much um, sort of 20th century history has been sort of attached to those ideas of differences, that that, that resulted in all kinds of different things subsequently in, in um, different black people's lives. Um, but I think one of the important things to think about in terms of African-American women that were wet nurses. Um, although some, some scholars have challenged the, the level of African-American enslaved wet nursing, suggesting that there were actually more, um, more white women breastfed their own children under slavery than, than previously assumed, or than the stories would suggest, since the, the, the mammy figure and the wet nurse figure is so prominent. I think one of the most important pieces of information to, to understand when thinking about the glorification of black women nursing white children is that to be able to nurse, she had to have her own children. And that where are those children in that, in that moment? And that's one of the greatest, um, it's one of those places where you can see the very thing that's so glamorized and loved is, is the, the piece of horror, really. Uh, women were isolated from, from community, from family members, um, oftentimes threatened, uh, threatened physically, emotionally, sexually from, by that isolation within the white household. Um, and so it's, it was a, a scene of terrible danger, I think, for people that's been turned into something really different. Now, at the same time, um, I, I don't want to deny that these are human beings locked in a situation together. And, and so when I said at the beginning that I think certainly both under slavery and afterwards in terms of domestic work relationships that, that um, African-American women must have, have found some kind of connection to different members of the white household in different situations, but that that was not this, this mammy image, that that's what I'm trying to, to defeat is that, that romantic version. Um, and in domestic work early on, you had African-American women tended to live with the families they worked for, so you had some of that isolation replicated and one of the things I look at with domestic work is how often in oral histories of domestic work relationships, women reported being called mammy in 1925. You know, and so the, this attempt in that moment to see that relationship. Um, but in the early 20th century, uh, African-American women increasingly, as the job became more defined as, a, as the job of African-American women over the early 20th century, um, you also had a movement to, to live out to actually not live with the families they worked for, which created a space for um, some, some resistance to those work relationships that had been very coercive, but 
but still kept people isolated in their workplace um, in that environment. And, and so that's why I think the Montgomery bus boycott was so important. sort of far afield, but the Mammy statue you said was proposed in the 20s mm -hmm. on the uh, grounds of the capital of the state of Alabama and also on the grounds of the capital of the state of South Carolina. There, is a st there are statues of James Marion Sims who practiced medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we now know from the book Medical Apartheid that he experimented a great deal with that anesthesia on black mm -hmm. women. Those statues, if I'm remember correctly, were erected by a women's medical auxiliary. Okay. And I'm just curious if there's any connection with that and the UDC work, or if you saw anything yeah. like that. I haven't, I haven't seen a, a specific connection. Um, it's not a connection I was specifically looking for, so I'm not sure if there's actually, if some of those women were also in the daughters, which seems likely. Um, are. It's the same figure in both states, yeah. and both states have very similar histories of yeah. this kind of thing. And it well, and it seems so. The, the jump to assume that the daughters would be connected somehow is such a good one, since they were responsible for so much of the monument building mm -hmm. um, across the South. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure specifically. Okay. Um, but that's, it's curious. a fascinating question, though, and it does, it, it, it sort of, I think, also fits into that the Mammy Jezebel. Yeah, Question kind of thing. Well. I don't know. It's, this is this whole thing is very interesting. It, well, you were mentioned in connection with the uh -huh. Tuskegee syphilis experiment too. Right. Sort of what the sexualized mm -hmm. history, because he became a great national hero for yeah. starting the women's hospital in New York, and it's curious this past. Yeah, well, and understanding that 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 the <clears throat> the racial history behind sort of the celebrated the mm -hmm. celebrated figure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.